He mihi ne nui rau atu ki a koutou ka tōko, tai mai tēnei wā. Yo um, rite tēnā, a hako he iti he paunamu. So no matter how small it is a treasure, and I'm thankful for anybody that came along to have a listen and have a um, get a viewpoint of what it is that I'm talking about. There's a bit of noise in the background over here because I've got these scaffolding people right outside my window. And if we're lucky enough, we might get the operator, the operator dude coming in and singing a few songs while we're going through it. Um, but the co-papa that I'm talking about today is Matauranga Māori, or Māori World View. Um, this is personally my own perspective of what it is. Um, for everyone, it will be a little bit different and a little bit unique based on what their thoughts are and where we, where we get our impetus from when we're trying to frame it. Um, if you take, for instance, the ones in Tuhoi, they have a totally different perspective because their environment because of the way that they are based and the, the actual um, impetus they have and how they live off the land and how the environment is specifically how they view everything for their survival is totally different for someone who lives in the city and someone who's been brought up mainly in urban centres. Um, although my iwi itself here in Ngāti Whātua um, was specifically, well, is really the only... Is a beginning of, of, of Māori people actually being subsumed within an urban environment. Um, so I have a bit of a mix. I was lucky enough to have a father who was a townie and a mother who was a real bush pig. So we were able to move between both worlds quite, quite happily and this is what that viewpoint is around. And hopefully you'll be able to get some of the stuff out of it um, to then move into how it means and what it means within the way that we interact um, not just myself, but even you might get ideas out, out of how you might use specific things and how important it is, not just for Māori and non-Māori, but I think that the viewpoint that we bring is something that can be used anywhere, um, and that's what I hope to, that you'll get out of it. So moving right along. Ooh. How does this... Okay. So in the beginning, there was nothing. Te kore. Te kore, the nothing, the unknown nothing. So this is really about the Māori worldview and the creation. Everyone talks about eel, which is the source or the puna of everything. But then we move from that into te kore. People call it the nothing. I call it the potential. The potential to move from a thought into the next realm. So in the beginning, there was nothing. It was te kore. The long night, the black night, the night spread out. The night unseen, for there was none to see. Unfelt, for there were none to feel. Night unknown, for there were none to know. And the heavens lay upon the earth, and darkness lay upon the heavens and the earth. It was the age of te ao e tere tere noana the world floating in space. So what that's bringing to you is the whole purpose of Eeyore who created the universe and then you had Rangi and Papa in a total embrace. And inside that, it was darkness, pure darkness. Now people have called it the nothing, but I always say that it's the potential. In the darkness were Rangi, the Sky Father, and Papa, the Earth Mother, the creators, creators of the clouds that fly, the winds that blow, the seas that roll, the rains that fall, the things that grow. All these were made by Rangi, the Great Sky Father, and Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. All these they created. Yes, they even created me. So we're now moving from Te Kure, where the children of Rangi and Papa are now going through the movement of trying to, we can't fit in here. We know that we have the potential, so what does that look like? So like we all do as we grow up as children, not only are we created, but then we start doing a bit of our own rebellion and start wanting to do something different. So this is where the children actually started 
to move and shake inside the, the loving embrace of their parents. And in the darkness, there were born a multitude of creatures, blind for they were sightless, thoughtless for they were mindless, motionless for they were without motion, inert, sightless, mindless, and feeling they lay. In the endless dark they lay, so lay the children of Rangi and Papa. So why I start with that is because the creation of how we are, even though people call it a myth, it isn't really because we all know scientifically the universe was created, it was created out of the nothing. Then all these planets came about. And then of course, we have Te Aumarama, for where the children have then separated their parents and we've got the Sky Father and the Earth Mother, still in an embrace, but not so loving and not so tight. So this is what we talk about as Te Ao Marama. And we actually believe that even though it might sound like a myth to everyone else, scientifically, it's the truth and we just viewed the world in a different way to everyone else. And that is what Mātauranga Māori is all about. It's a world view or a viewpoint from a Māori person's perspective. If I asked you what would be the Mātauranga of a Pacific Islander, a mātauranga of someone from Scotland, a Celt, an Irishman, a Sami person. They would all have, and one of the things I have noted throughout the world is that we all have a creation story. And so all the work and everything that we do is based on that foundation of having a creation story. So I'm going to introduce my creation how my world has not just been about my creation itself, but the environment and the workings behind it. For instance, my lucky marae, it's a beautiful marae, this marae, sits right in the middle of a black spot. Well, when you fly over it at night, it's a black spot. There's no lights on it whatsoever. But I know that I've reached home because there is my whenua that lays down before me. Now, a marae is the um, community centre. And for us, when we were actually moved from our papakainga down below at Okahu Bay, or Okahu Matamomoi, we were then evicted to the top of the hill. All of this hillside used to be just bushland. The flat area down below was where we actually had our houses, but it also housed all our vegetable gardens, and it gave us pure access to the sea. So we had our, our, our food from the sea, our food from the land and our food for thought was when we were able to engage with each other as a community. When we moved to the Topi, um, my, my father was born down in the Papakainga down below and about the age of three was when they were evicted from out of there and moved to the top. It took 40 years for us to actually build this marae. And even in the 40 years, what happened for many of us is that the likes of um, education came in and my parents, or my parent, my father, actually lost his language. He could understand, but he didn't actually have his language. So the marae played an integral part in the time that it took us. It was nearly two generations pretty much nearly lost their language, but they didn't lose their community feel, and being able to have a marae come back to them that they could actually use as a communal space to share and teach and learn, it became integral to the way that we were brought up. We were how to do kids, and this area, we liked it better when it had no tiles down on the floor because it hurts our feet. They're quite stony, um, and we like running around in the mud and, and everything else that was part of the area in the whenua that used to look out, um, that used to be around the outside of it. And here it is, all in its full glory. Um, this is the work that we've done. So this has been integral for my, my upbringing. Um, is that this is the whenua that I played on as a kid. Me and my sister, uh, my brothers, one of the things that was also strong about this whenua was that we knew all the stories. It was about rangatiratanga or about being able to know who you were, um, where you came from and what it meant. And then just around the corner, you've got the big, huge city overlooking you 
and all the millionaires looking across from their, their, their viewpoint on Paratai Drive going, oh my gosh, look at those bloody houses over there with all those darkies on it. Beautiful sites. You know, the, the potential for, for what was happening on this land um, was huge from their consideration around money value. But for us, it was never ever about money value. And this whenua plays a huge role. And for us, um, one of the big things that we have done on this whenua is to regrow, bring back its natural, uh, the natural habitat. Um, although they haven't done a good job, because I know in this area over here used to be a huge swamp. And we used to get a growling because we used to be told, don't you ever go to the barracks? These are the barracks that were made um, in the time that we were booted up onto the top of the hill. They took these and said the Russians were coming, so they needed to put something on the, on the um, peninsula to make sure that they could shoot at the Russians. That didn't come. Um, so we used to be told, don't you ever go over there? But of course we did. We had our huts. We had our forts. It was a place for us to play as kids. But again, we were able to come here and learn about the stories of why we were moved from the bottom down here and kicked up to the top over here. Again, our maunga, one of the things that are very strong, as people are aware, we have our maunga, um, our awa. Our awa, of course, is the Waitemata, and there's a beautiful city that you can see. <laughs> For us, um, for many of us, the ruin of this place was really around the, the lack of potential that we had to actually survive on the sea anymore. Um, although we still go fishing out on the wharf, um, we're slowly rebuilding again. We're rehabiting um, the shellfish back into the, to the area, um, really in a response to trying to be environmentally friendly and getting the environment back involved. Um, and taking away all the pollution. So we're slowly working towards that. Um, we've been successful so far, mainly in our area, but it's, it's a really big thing for us because um, Tangaroa gave us the life blood, um, which is both your blue veins and your, and your blue blood and your red blood. And if you actually lose more than 4%, you die. So we're trying to make sure that we're always going to be there and surviving especially for our children. Now, what the hell does that have to do with Mātauranga Māori? Okay? Like you can, you can utilise this for any viewpoint. It's the view of the world at this time because it's Mātauranga Māori through the eyes of Māori. It's based around our principles, our, our values and philosophies, the kaupapa of what we do to build our foundation to then grow. And the ability to grow and use our tikanga or our processes to actually ensure that we survive. And the main thing about survival, of course, is our genealogical links and spirituality, our whakapapa and our wairuatanga, with our understanding of who you are, where you are, and what the earth and the sky mean to us in its environment. So it helps us actually formulate and connect. So when we connect, um, here in Auckland, I always talk about how we are tangata whenua, and anybody who lives in the CBD or visits or works in the CBD are manuhiri. Therefore, I must, as tangata whenua, look after them. And the best way I can look after them is to ensure that there are things in place that are beneficial for them. And we're still fighting that fight because, as you know, things just don't happen like that, especially when you've got councils that want to, you know, spend everything, buy everything, sell everything. Um, but then that's where it comes from. So this, this structure here is how Mātauranga Māori is actually in play. This I, pin, I pinched from um, the Māori subject headings, and that eo, or the kaupapa, is the actual centre of the universe, and that it has, it's the beginning, it's the source. So if you think about when you have an idea and you, you really want to get that idea up and running, you know how you get that funny feeling in your stomach and your stomach rumbles? Well, even when you have a child, that's where the source is. So that is your puna, that is your source, and that is where te kore happens. From out of, from out of eel grows te kore, which is your spiritual side in, in the advent of Māori subject headings, but that's because people call it the nothing, but it's the potential. So when you're sitting there and that rumbling's taking place and it starts to move, 
you know, you get that funny feeling and you're like, oh, that's sort of like the weight of it starting to build. It then moves from that and it actually gets into your brain, your hiningaro, and it becomes te pō. So it moves from the potential into te pō to actually then look at what's going to happen from here. If I've created something, how am I going to make it known? From te pō, it actually moves from out of your brain and you either talk about it, you create a diagram, or you actually create a writing. So you actually, it's about the sharing and bringing it to light so that others can have a look and think, okay, that sounds interesting to me. How can I then take that thought and that whakaro and then move it to the next phase? So that's how Mātauranga Māori starts from eo in the beginning when we talked about the nothing, um, how I've utilised it to talk about the whenua and the things that mean the most to me as a Māori person, and then how I've brought it through to actually see how it can actually develop from a thought, um, from the from its source, through to being able to share it like I am today. Okay, this I stole from Te Wānango Raukawa. It is not a URL, so if you click on it, it shouldn't go anywhere. Um, but it actually holds on to what they call the Ten Tangans. Um, those that are aware of the Māori Party and pretty much the Mana Party, um, Te Wānanga or Aotearoa, a lot of their policies are based around these. Now, these are actually ten, uh, what we call the ten tangas, because we're just naughty by saying that, but it's about whakapapa, wairua, whanaungatanga, te reo rangatiratanga, ukaipo, manakitanga, pūkengatanga, kaitiakitanga and kotahitanga. I'm only going to mention a few of those things because we're running out of time and I've gone too far. So whanaunga tanga, what is whanaunga tanga really about? What is the epitome of what it is to be a whanaunga? Oh, come on. Go faster. It is about family. It is about your friends and your colleagues. Whanaunga tanga and how you utilise this within your organisation is to realise that your organisation, whether it be a school, whether it be a library, whether it just be a club, you are a family, and in that family, you must be united in the way that you actually build upon things. You must have the trust and loyalty of each other to ensure that you can move forward. So whanaungatanga plays a huge role in anything. And for us as a family, if we, if we moved as a community, we'd probably get a lot more done than what we currently do because we're too busy bickering with each other at the moment. Um, but whanaungatanga is something that you need to be trustworthy of, your friends, your colleagues, and who support you. It's not just how you get, how you as an individual feel, but how you participate in the teamwork that you do, um, how your organisation also recognises you. So recognize, the recognition of what it is that you bring, you bring to your family unit to ensure that it moves in the right direction. Manaki Tanga, it is a, more about your customer service, but it's also about mana aki. And that the resources that you house and look after is you are the spokesperson for them. They can't really speak on behalf of themselves. You, videos can, but then videos have to be shown. If people don't know they're out there, then they're not going to be utilised and they're not going to be respected in such a way. The way that you can also think about manaki tanga is when you're weeding. When you're weeding, if you think about the environment that's going to take all of those books and you're going to mash them up and throw them into the earth, or wherever they might be, you should possibly think that because they have something to say within those resources, whether they're in a video, a DVD, um, in paper format, whichever media format they are, maybe someone else will still get something out of it. So instead of throwing it in the bin, Think about who you can support and who you can enhance in the mana that they bring by sharing the resources that you have. So not only do you help weave your respective collections, you're actually passing it on so it's able to share its knowledge with someone else. And why is that? Because it has whakapapa. And the whakapapa of the uh, item um, is what actually you're respecting and what you're, what you're moving through to. It's just really a reminder. You're not an owner. 
for parents, it's a little bit more easier for them to understand this because they know they're only a custodian. They're moving into a, into a place where they've got to try and make something better for the future generations in the survivor book and the ability for you to survive. In Kaitiakitanga, it is purely about that. Libraries need to move away from thinking that they own things. They might pay for it, but they don't actually own it. Your community owns it. How does your community own it? Because it's actually your ratepayers that pay for it. It's your taxpayers that actually pay for it, not you as an institution. You're, you're using our money, so we should be able to say what happens within your space. And to be able to do that, you've got to have proper guardianship and custodianship and share, and that's a big one. It's not an individual's outlook. You're there as a community. You do not own it. And it helps you to then sharing also bring sustainability because you're looking at succession planning. As I said, as a custodian, don't throw the stuff away. Actually enhance someone else's. Okay, so the URL plays a huge role in what we do. Um, like I said, I only mentioned a few of them, but um, what I will do is I'll share um, the other the other seven that I didn't mention uh, with Joanna because I've got them hidden at the moment. Um, and then you'll be able to use that to see where they might fit in in other areas. So in Māori Knowledge Frameworks, not translation. Māori Knowledge Frameworks are based on a Māori point of view that has kaupapa, the foundation, that we're able to then grow processes and policies out of to ensure that we as an organisation and as a people can move forward and all in the same direction. So it helps us to actually intertwine everything that we do. And this is really getting into that high, whole bicultural matter. We're not there to say, this is it and you've got to do this. It's about how we actually interlink with each other, interact with each other and intertwine them where we possibly can. It might not be that you intertwine them fully. It might be that some sit outside, but they sit next door to each other. So that when they actually walk together in that same framework, none of them are missed out. One's not better than the other. They walk together. Um, so this is the same thing. It's just about, so the aronga, the Māori worldview, the kaupapa, the foundations that you do, the tikanga. And these are some um, links here that actually look at other health models. So the Māori health model is one that, that actually brought about a lot of the work that we're bringing together here in Māori knowledge frameworks because you know, even that um, whare tapawha that um, Mason Jury talks about and the whake model, it was about the health and well-being of people. It talks about it as Māori people, but the health and well-being for Māori people is to ensure that even the visitors on its whenua are also healthy and are, are well thought of. You know, that they are also looking after themselves because if they look after themselves and we all look after each other, the community is able to survive and support each other in a better way. So where to from here? Although I didn't get into other things, if you want to look at other ways that you might want to continue your journey about Mātauranga Māori, um, these are some different online presentations. Manuel Academy does a lot of Kōrero around Mātauranga Māori, around research, uh, Māori Indigenous research frameworks. Te Atārangi, of course, is Te Reo, um, same as Te Wānanga Aotearoa, but the Māori Ora program, um, there's a Māori Ora program, and I think there's a Mana, Mana Māori as the other program with Te Wānanga Aotearoa. They're all free courses, um, but mainly it's just to, if you want to step out to the next way, to the next point of view from here, you can go and have a look at those. Um, this conversation's on Mātauranga Māori. There's another book that's came out recently, which is the second edition. Um, well, not a second edition, it's the next set of stories. Um, it's just to provide you with further background and information if you want to take it further. So, kaha te meo te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is all about us because it's us that actually have a huge impact on the things that we do in our institutions as people who are able to connect with each other as well as we seem to be the doers. Even though we might not do it properly all the time, we need to be able to work together in such a way that it moves forward for the betterment of all, really. So pretty much like I said, I don't think Mātauranga Māori is something new. 
per se. I just think it's we see it from different view, viewpoints um, and we interact with it in different ways. Um, I was going to finish off and make us all sing the Why at the because all of you guys that are going to conference should be singing this and learning this. Um, so I'm going to sing it anyway, and then if you've got any questions, you can go for it. Kei roto rai tēnei ke te te ke te Haro nui e Ko te ke te ruruku o te rangi E ranga hau aema Ki ngā wāna ngā uru uru tawhito Ko ia nei te tua te ea Ko te ke te wahi rangi E ranga hau ana, ki ngā wāna ngā uru uru tipu wā, ko ia nei te tua uri. Ko te ke te whanui, ko ngā uru uru mātua, ke roto rā i tēnei ke te te ke te. Aro nui e, e roto ra i te ne ke te te ke te, aro nui e. Nō rei re te whana, he nuhi nui nui rau atu, kia koutou, kia kaha, kia maia, kia mana wa nui. Kia ora! Questions! Kia ora, Anahira. I'm not sure that I actually have questions, but... Um, I was very much enjoyed your talk and um, the way you presented it was was really easy to um, embrace so I thank you very much for that um, and particularly the the kaitiakitanga was um, a really good fit for me in community library so I hope I might have access to your notes so I can um, digest it a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I'll make sure I send it through to, um, to Joanna. Thank you. Yeah, that was really great, Anahira. I think Inez and I both got a lot out of that too. I'd say. And Ruth, you got any questions? Were well, you trying to hide away at work then? Looks like she's got a full room. Yes, I'm in an open plan. Yes, no, it's good to keep hearing it again and again and again until, you know, it becomes so natural that you don't have to think consciously about it. So, yeah. I'm Pākehā working in a wānanga, so <laughs> I'm oh, you still got a good learning, job. making it. I have indeed, <laughs> but I'm still learning. <laughs> no, well, is yeah. that us? I think that's us. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. But if you do have any questions or anything that you think of later on, uh, my email is a.morehu at auckland.ac.nz. So email me through. Um, you don't want to ring me just in case because most of the time I'm not in the office, but I always answer my emails. So any other questions that you might think of or, or um, even if it's not related to the presentation itself, but there's something else that might crop up from, from that afterwards, um, yeah, no, just give me a buzz. Sure thank you all again. And thanks, Joanna, Inez. Thanks. Catch you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.